I'm just going to speak about a project that I did last year at the Ian Potter Museum of Art. And when I was listening to the first speaker today, um, Rika, I was, I guess, again reminded of that very interesting relationship between the artwork, the artist and the audience. And I think, I guess I could say that's always informed what I've done right from the very beginning. I mean, the first exhibition I had back in 1982 called Disclosures had a whole lot of photos hanging from the ceiling that people had to proceed down. And so right from the very beginning, if you like, I sort of felt this need to engage the audience very directly, um, almost as, as performers themselves in the work. And maybe that also comes from a background where, you know, I was connected to performance art in the 70s. So I think that performative thing's always present, but as I say, the audience is sort of involved in that process too. But this relationship between um, how an audience comes into a work of art and where we make that work of art, particularly with remaking the world, um, which I'll explain in a minute, um, that became a sort of central question for me. So. I had a show, I think it was probably at Ros and Oxley's in about 2013, and I sort of reached this point where I felt like I was always, you know, booking a date for a show, getting agitated, making the work for it, and feeling this kind of strange pressure, and I felt this desire to sort of return to a state which I think I experienced much more as a younger artist, where I just made work and sort of shows came up. So I decided that I didn't want to work under that pressure anymore, that I wouldn't book any shows and I'd just kind of hang out in my studio for a while. And then, you know, as sort of things would happen, I, got, I started to make a lot of work and then I was approached by the Ian Potter Museum about this show. So I then did have a venue for it, but sort of 18 months hence. And what I learned from that was, I mean, it's probably a fairly obvious thing to say, but with that kind of two-year framework, I felt like the studio became the place where I could kind of invent all these things without really in sort of having any involvement with anyone looking at that work. I just felt like I could live in my own space in that sense. And that, I mean, that's a very obvious thing to say, but um, it was as if I hadn't had that kind of opportunity for quite a while. Now, at the same time, there, you know, because one works on sort of different, different sorts of ideas and things at the same time, there was a project that came up in Sydney which I put forward an idea for, which is called Remaking the World, Artist Dreaming. Um, and this was for a public work that John Caldor... I mean, I didn't... I, I got shortlisted, but I didn't end up getting it. But... Um, and I'll just show you the video. So this is just a... Um, a kind of, and I think it's quite interesting in this process to do this, is to show a work that hasn't been made or went on to be made in a different form. Um, but the proposal for this work, Remaking the World Artist Dreaming, was this idea that through the city of Sydney, you could have these projections, and I mean, these are just mock-ups, obviously, of artists asleep. Um, and create a sort of journey through the city where, you know, some would be projected quite small in different kinds of locations so that people, in a way, sort of went on a kind of journey, a bit like a derive through the city, encountering these different um, people asleep. Now, you might ask the obvious question, you know, we all dream, we all sleep, we all dream, why artists? And... The thing I was sort of working with in this idea, and I think it goes back to well, all the conversations so far today, is um, how do we move from this state of, you know, all the things that artists produce? And I suddenly thought, if we look through time and across, you know, all the museums of the world, um, what we really see is all these individuals sort of take on the world. And because... I guess as visual artists, we actually make something. I mean, everyone dreams. I mean, you could write a book, you could write a piece of music. But what interested me was the fact that artists produce, whether it's photos, paintings, objects or whatever, but they actually manifestly produced something into the world which is very sort of 
you know, animate and there. And that all these museums and so on are these sort of storehouses for all these individual sort of takes on the world. And I thought that was really interesting to observe artists asleep, imagining that they are, as it were, sort of thinking up these ideas. Um, so that work sort of just sort of got parked because it wasn't going to be made. And then when the curator from the Impotter came and discussed, you know, what we were going to do for the show, some of you may know that space. I know Jane would know it well in Melbourne. And it's, I've always noticed when you came into the space, there's these two big rooms down the bottom, which is the rooms that I was offered. And I always thought they were like this kind of bipolar thing because they kind of are like a face-off. And my thir first thought, because, you know, for me, often space is like a character in my work. You know, it, it, it's something where I'm pitching into that kind of space and it has an effect on how I think I'm going to produce the work. So I suddenly, in talking about this work, um, to it was Vincent Alessi who was the curator, he loved this idea and he thought maybe we could put it through Melbourne University, which would have been fantastic, but, you know, as things happen logistically, that wasn't possible. So we had a long discussion about how we could recreate this work for that museum. And then, you know, I went away and thought about it and then I came up with this idea that I'd just call the whole show Remaking the World um, and that I would do this playoff between the two spaces. So, um, let me just move to the next. Now, I put a little bit of text up here because I haven't prepared a paper per se, but just to give a little bit of background before we, I guess, proceed into how I then conceived of that show. So, the um, curator, jean Herbert Martin, who some of you may have seen, he curated a show at Mona called The Theatre of the World. And I've followed him. You might, his history was he, many years ago, did um, Magicians of the Earth at the Pompidou. And he's done curated shows at the Fortuny Museum in Venice. And I really love the way he thinks. Um, and as you see there from those words, his idea of the theatre of the world as a pragmatic form of thinking, a practical philosophy taking material form and objects. And what he's kind of known for um, is often to put different works by, and it could be sort of ethnographic works with, you know, contemporary work, with older work, in a sort of collision course with one another to create these very dynamic conversations. And I've always really loved that approach curatorially. And in a, in a way it resonated with how I think I make and put things together, um, you know, like a lot of artists. Um, so with this idea of remaking the world, which of course is a slightly preposterous suggestion for an exhibition, but it was influenced by Martin's thinking. And it created a provocation for me. I mean, if you think about, I, I don't go around constantly with ideas in my head. I sort of, I need something to provoke me. And that was a kind of, remaking the world became this sort of way of provoking a way to think about how I might sort of produce work for this show. And the other thing that I wanted and I've always been really interested in is it's almost a quite theatrical thing is how to create a sort of atmosphere in a show and how to, you know, whether you're using sound, moving image, still image, etc., and how they all sort of resonate together. I'm very interested in that kind of atmospheric sort of feeling in a show. Um, and so, you know, I mean, this is a bit after the fact when the show is up, I start to think that it was a bit like a kind of Plato's cave or a, or a sort of cabinet of curiosities or whatever. I was trying to create that sort of ambience. That was in one part of the show. Um, and as I say here, for me, I guess an exhibition is a kind of testing site. I don't really see it as something that's just complete in itself, even though, you know, it gets open, the show's up, but it sort of keeps running in your mind and that's, of course, how you go on, sets up sort of other challenges for new works to come. So it is a kind of testing site. Um, and of course, as we, you know, was discussed very beautifully in that first presentation, um, it's an act of communication. So, you know, otherwise you just could make things and keep them in your back room. You don't, it's the very, and I mean, I say that to my students a lot too, that that, that is that difference that when you're producing something in your studio, you're making art, you're making it for all your own reasons or whatever. But the minute you put it out into the world, you're putting it out there to communicate something. And as I say here, you know, that it's a conversation where you don't have to agree with one another on it. So, you know, that's what makes art exciting in that sort of way. Um, 
So ultimately, I guess what I had hoped in, re in the exhibition Remaking the World was that I wanted the audience, and you'll see as we go through the images, to sort of roam through and in a certain sense end up remaking the world in their own image, which is kind of what you do anyway. I mean, whatever artists, you know, pour into it from their own experiences and, you know, make all your decisions, but really when it encounters an audience, and we saw that again in that first talk, it's very fascinating how people, of course, filter that through their own experiences and how they try and interpret something from it. Um, I, just one sort of side comment I want to make about that, and I guess we can talk about that when we have the general discussion, is like a lot of artists, I'm also, I also teach. Um, and I often find with students that everyone wants to rush into interpretation really quickly, you know, the meaning question. And actually from another teacher I used to teach with when I was teaching at Monash, we used to pull them back from that position and ask them, what are you actually looking at? How is it made? Describe it very literally and materially. And I think that's a very important thing to remember because when you're making things, it's not like you just got this big idea in your head and you're heading towards it. You're sort of in that process of making, you're adjusting all the time. So we should remember that, I think, in the way that we look at work it's actually a made thing and those decisions are embedded in that too. Um, so, from that first sort of idea of the remaking the world artist streaming, we came up with this idea that um, at Ian Potter that for a certain push, and we couldn't sort of do it for the four months of the show or whatever because it costs a bomb to rent those really big projectors, but at least for about 10 days, what we did was project the artist that I chose to sleep on the outside of the building. Um, and I'll just explain a little bit because I always think maybe what is interesting is how artists go about making their decisions and actually making things. So, you know, it's one thing to have an idea, okay, I'm going to ask a whole lot of my artist mates if they'll come to my studio and sleep for me and sleep on this idea of remaking the world. Um, so what I had to do is build a room in my studio which was private that they could go in and sleep in. And then I, of course, it was only private up to a point because they had a camera looking down on them that ran into a computer. And it was actually a really, a sort of a really um, gorgeous thing to do was to collaborate with a lot of my mates to do this work for the Ian Potter. So in the two rooms of the Ian Potter, I had the one collaborative work, which I'll show you in a moment, with them all sleeping, and the other room was remaking the world in her image, which was in a sort of sense my opportunity to go for it just as a single artist. So um, I'll just keep going because then you'll see this one's um, Joyce Hinterding. Um, you probably possibly know her work as sleep. So I'm just going racing through. So in the left side of the space when you came into the room was Remaking the World Artist Dreaming and I intentionally had all their names there. So the idea for that work, and it played off against the other room, which was very intense and kind of crowded in a way, was this room with all these images of these artists asleep. So they're videoed, so it, they're not stills. And when I went to the space and I thought, okay, we're gonna project them on the outside, but I also want to use one of the rooms there to put them in how should I do that? How should I represent these 30 artists as sleeping? And then I had this sort of funny idea. I thought, what sleeps in the day? And I thought, oh, well, bats sleep in the day. So as you do, I thought, right, I'll hang them all upside down from the ceiling. And of course, you know, I always have those nutty ideas and then you've got to go and spend hours talking to people to work out how to actually make that happen which, of course, we mustn't forget is part of the fun of making art too, you know. It's just making those decisions. You can have a great idea in your head, but how you translate that and get other people to help you or whatever to make it be realised is really the sort of fun part, I think. So, basically, we went about solving this by building these big steel um, supports that ran five of them from the ceiling. And then on each of the five, there were four LCD screens. And the sleeping artists, I mean, they, when they came to my studio, I asked them to sleep for about an hour. And a lot of people said to me, oh, I bet they weren't sleeping. They were probably, you know, pretending to sleep. But the funny thing is when you're filming someone, you know, because most people, of course, they don't fall asleep immediately, but I'd be hovering outside the room looking at my um, 
my monitor, you know, of the, on my computer, and I could sort of... So I'd tell them, go in the room, you know, lie down, think about remaking the world as an artwork, so in they'd hop. And then I'd wait. I wouldn't start filming immediately. They didn't know that. And then I'd sneak back in again... And you can tell when someone's asleep because their breathing changes and so on. So then I'd sort of put it on. And, of course, I was one of the sleepers, so I know when I went in to do it, I was incredibly anxious because I thought, I'll be the one who doesn't fall asleep. So I kept counting back from 100 all the time. And then the funny thing is, when you think about it, you actually don't know that moment that you fall asleep. And so (laughs) when I did it, all I heard somewhere in the proceedings is, you know, Julie, wake up, you know. And then I thought, oh, my God, I've been asleep. So, you know, that's what happens. It's that sort of funny liminal space. And, of course, um, because they were all in my studio, we have a, co- a cup of tea afterwards and have a chat. So, you know, it was a sort of a very interesting and amusing process. Someone asked me in an interview, did you know, did you discuss with them what they thought up as a work? And I said, no, that's, that's not the project that belongs to them. So from an audience perspective of this work, you know, what you're really seeing is a whole lot of artists, maybe, dreaming up some idea for an artwork. Um, And then, of course, the reason why I have the names there is the idea was that some of them, you know, people like Michaela Dwyer or, you know, sort of better know Lindy Lee or whatever, artists that you may know the work of, But basically these days, whether you're sort of a very well-known artist or an artist starting out, most people have a presence on Google. So the idea of putting their names there was that the audience, if they wanted to, could go and look up those names and they'd see what each of those artists produced. And it's like this thing travelling in your mind as a viewer that you're sort of involved in this kind of potential space, if you like. And, of course, you know, I chose artists of different ages, stages, you know, males, females, whatever, you know, different kinds of practices. So really what that room became was this, as I say, this kind of storehouse of potentiality of these works that may exist in the future. They may never exist. It doesn't really matter. But each of those artists individually create these worlds for us to experience. Um, And they're, you know individual in that sense. Janet Lyons. People who went into that room told me that, um, you know, afterwards, that they stayed in there a very long time because they found it incredibly peaceful. Um, and it, it was kind of quite interesting because when you first went in, it sort of felt very still, but of course, you know, someone over on another monitor would roll over or do something and then suddenly you'd be alert to the fact that they were all asleep. I also, there were 30 people who slept and 20 screens. And what we did in the edit was we sort of moved them around. So they weren't all in a fixed position. They kept changing. So it was very promiscuous sleeping. They were all sleeping with one another and, you know, very art world. (laughs) We all cracked up laughing. It was very funny. Because some people go, oh, God, I'm sleeping next to blah, blah. (laughs) Anyway, it was very gossipy. And, um, you know, art, artists are pretty tribal, so I thought it was a very funny thing to do. I mean, the ongoing idea f- for this project, and I'm just t- talking to a couple of people now, is to try and keep it going by doing it in other cities of the world with other artists local to that city. So, you know, I can be a real utopian and think, you know, ten years down the track I would have got a thousand artists to sleep on remaking the world. You know, and I had an interesting... <coughs> conversation with someone from Istanbul who went, you know what, if you had artists, if we put it through the city with artists asleep, that would be a really controversial thing in that culture. So it's something, you know, you don't really know when you sort of move into other realms of how that would be perceived. She actually had a fantastic idea. She said, you know what we could do? We could get a truck and we could put a projection screen on the back of the truck and we'll just zip from one neighbourhood to the other. (laughs) presumably with the cops chasing us or whoever, but anyway. So, you know, hopefully it'll have a future. Oh, David Haynes, he's the only one... I told everyone just to sort of, you know, I gave him a T-shirt to wear so everything was the same, but he had bright red underpants on, so... (laughs) And he sleeps on his stomach, so... Anyway, you know, you find out funny things about people when they sleep. Hilarious. I think that's Anne Ferrin in there. Anyway, look, it's, it, it's, 
a project that I got a huge amount of pleasure from. It was really fun. Now, in the other room, of course, you know, as David Haynes said to me, you know, that was the most witchery work you've ever made, Julie. <laughs> um, and this was the other room, which was really over the top and sort of semi-successful, I'd say. Like, we had a few issues. You know, it, it's typical of me to want to try and show a moving image, objects and photographs all in the same space. But I don't know, it was very dark. I mean, people kept kicking the projectors, you know, <laughs> classic audience participation. Um, but, you know, I'm pretty loose about things like that and I still, I sort of, in a way, was quite happy with the sort of, um, I don't know, I guess the sort of intensity of the energy of it, hopefully. And it was also quite a decentered show. So, you know, I like to work with an audience in the sense of them, and I mean, I guess all artists do that, obviously, but to, to try and figure out for themselves. So when that earlier conversation was happening about wall labels, I mean, I can't stand wall labels, I have to say. You know, I, I actually quite like myself just to move through and look at things, even though I'm aware that, you know, people like a bit of information. But we didn't sort of provide much information for this, so the idea was for people to try and negotiate it. But obviously, you know, it's called Remaking the World in Her Image in capital letters, so quite obviously I was playing games, as I tend to do. Um, and, you know, sort of, in a way, kind of not being too serious about the whole creative process, at the same time, you know, asking people to sort of enjoy this idea or this proposition, but really quite tongue-in-cheek in a certain way. But I did think, you know, given all those sort of creation myths starting from, you know, his image of the world, I thought it would be quite fun to start it from her image of the world. Um, so this is just the sort of layout of it. Oh, this is a video. And as you saw from that, um, from the previous installation shot, this was, I don't know, about sort of seven metres across or something. So this was a sort of central focus. So, you know, obviously I'm playing a game with this idea of the all-seeing being. <laughs> um, so, of course, you know, if your eyes... Someone asked me, is that a real... And I said, yeah, my eye, I'm able to do that with my eyes. <laughs> I've, I've been training, you know. Um, so, obviously, you know, it's the all-seeing. And, of course, if you see everything, what, do you, what happens is you go blind. Um, so, this video moved, you know, on a loop where I sort of go blind. It's called Double Eclipse. And um, I sort of like that, uh, that metaphor, you know. If you look at an eclipse, you actually can go blind. But we all know, you know, when you're told not to look at something, you're absolutely dying to do it. So... You know, this video, as, a, as it were, oversaw the whole exhibition. Um, so she, I'm calling it, it is a she. I look a bit uh, animal-like. I've always, quite, animals sort of creep into my work unintentionally, and I've found, I don't quite know why that is. Um, so anyway, this was looping, it's nearly finished, you'll just sort of see. So it goes through this, and then, wait for it. <laughs> so... And that, of course, was, as you can see, was sort of overseeing the whole thing. Then these big photos, um, I don't know, what am I trying to do here? I don't know if I'm vomiting or I'm inhaling or quite what. Um, and, you know, I don't know, it's, it, making art's a funny thing. I kind of let myself do what I like, really. I'm very, um, I just go for it. But I guess it's like this big sort of spilling of these images. Um, and I just thought I'd take you a little bit behind the scenes, which is sometimes kind of fun. The way I started making those images is I printed these pictures of myself, one each side on this cloth. And then I went to um, a photographer who prints for me a lot and just asked, I'd throw the image in the air. So just, I guess, to reintroduce that idea of the performative in how I work, you know, because photography is often just a means to an end for me in that sort of sense. It's a way to get a, an image happening. So basically I threw this about a thousand times and then we sort of deep etched them and then that became my element in the work. I could build that because, of course, digitally I can shift the colour um, and so, you know, if we go back to that, there's about, I don't know, hundreds of them in there and they're all different. 
So that became like this building blocks, really. And then, of course, I could shift the colour, so I sort of had, you know, spurting up, spurting down. Um, and, they, and then they formed together to create this very big image, which is about four metres square, which, you know, photographically you have to sort of bump them together as kind of smaller images. So it was just to sort of create this kind of, in a way, quite humorous proposition of remaking the world through the self... And, I mean, I th we think of selfies and we think of cloning and we think of how much image, images, how saturated we are, as Jan was saying, then, in a way, I'm playing a game with that sort of conclusion, if you like. Um, and then, within that, the two circles you can see, there were also videos projected. And this video, in a way, and I'll just skip through these still... seem to want to do it. Yeah, what do I do? Oh, maybe I've got a other light. There it is. I'll just show a little bit of this so we're running out of time. But this, uh, as one of the circles in the thing, this was quite important. So this is sort of like giving you a little clue. Again, two images printed on a cloth. And I'm just kind of throwing this image. So I guess... One thing I should mention is if you've seen those galleries, they've got, they're kind of cavernous. They've got very high ceilings. And so obviously the sleepers worked quite well because they were hanging into that middle area of the space. The other room, Remaking the World, in her image, same very big space. I wanted to try and make the viewer, as it were, move between detail, you know, to the, say like the very big video of the eyes down again to the ground to sort of smaller things across to the photo. So I, was, I really wanted, if you like, that experience of that room to use all the volume of the space. Um, so, you know, there was a kind of narrative. I'm not really a narrative artist, but there was a sort of a narrative running through this and that this image was like a bit of a clue. It's the only one in which I directly appear. Um, but anyway, it just gives you a bit of a sense. I'm getting the wind up, so I'm rushing now. Looking back the other way, there was also an interactive video that moved in response to your body. So you can see it was pretty crowded. But just very quickly, the other important element in this show were these sculptures that I made. Um, and I often use, my, obviously, we, you probably know that, use myself and cast from myself a lot, were these hand sculptures. And they were like this kind of... They were like characters in the room that were also a kind of audience. But you... But the viewer going into this show was intended to participate with them. So you can see this one, these hands are counting, the other one's framing. The one down here on the right's measuring. You can actually move that hand up and down, which is pretty funny. Like David Haynes said to me, that's good, it's not calibrated, Julie. <laughs> what are you measuring there? Well, I had a few comments about that. Um, <laughs> won't go further. Um, this is called <laughs> one hand making the other hand. So, you know the creative process in action, peeping. And the idea was people would go up and look through these kind of configurations at the show, someone participating. And that's as they are, you know, just taken in my studio. I've got to show some of this work at Ros and Oxley's in a few weeks, and so it's kind of interesting because I'll refigure it very differently and probably emphasise the sculptures more. But so they, they, I call them instruments. So it was just sort of using my hands as a kind of substitute viewer in a way for the viewer in the show to kind of, in a sense, be guided as a way to look at the show. So counting, framing, peeping. That one's, you know, when you were a kid you used to look through at things like a little telescope. Um, hooting and whistling. So I think, Jan, you'd appreciate <laughs> silent noise, as it were. Clapping and one hand making the other. So they were like these kind of, you know, I, I like the idea there was these characters in the show who could clap and whistle at the work. So, and there's the measuring one. And then the other one's called touching and pointing. They were cast aluminium. Um, and as I say, I 
chose that material very specifically because it, I was thinking of them as these instruments and so they got this kind of slightly cool quality. So I think that's it. I'm just going to, I know we're going to get up on stage, so um, I thought maybe while we're speaking, see how we go, I should sleep in the background. <laughs> I don't do anything when I sleep, so you think you're looking at a stick. <laughs>